Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to resilience, business continuity, disasters, well-being, COVID, anything that can help you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there, so I'm really easy to find, and I do respond to everything I get. Alternatively, you can find me at alexfullick.com. And one quick announcement, I will be presenting this year at the BCI World Conference in uh, November, and uh, I will actually be doing a keynote speech with Margaret Millett, who uh, you may have seen on the show before. So I'm looking forward to that. I won't tell you what our subject is, not yet, until formal announcements come out, but I can give you the heads up now. Uh, many of you may know who today's guest is. He's back for his fifth appearance, believe it or not. Mark Armour, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Alex. Is this really the fifth time? I can't believe I keep getting invited back. I, I, thought, I <laughs> thought you would have kicked me off the first time. No, no. Actually, the first talk ended up going over three episodes, if I recall. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> so how have you been doing? Can't complain. Um, so, so those of you who may not know, I went from being uh, Director of Global Business Continuity at Brinks to now being uh, Senior Director of Global IT Governance, Risk and Compliance. So in my new role, obviously, it's expanded to include governance, policy management, uh, risk management, compliance activities. I did get to keep my business resilience responsibilities. Um, and in taking on this new focus, uh, I was able to, to jettison the, the technology recovery piece. So so gives me some more focus really kind of on the, on the business facing side. And probably some uh, new insights uh, to share with us too, eh? some new experiences. Indeed, indeed. I mean, so, some, some lessons I already knew, and then I'm learning many, many new ones in the process. So it's been <laughs> a steep learning curve, but, uh, but nonetheless valuable and, and has and is still informed my, my work in the resilience and the business continuity field as well. Hence why it's taken so while to uh, hook up. I know you've been really busy with this change, so I'm glad. You I have, I too. have. I apologize. <laughs> Your listeners may not know the the the, the challenges we had in, in scheduling and, and my continued delays and, and cancellations. But I'm glad we we got to this point eventually. So we good. got here, you and got we're going to talk about one of your favorite subjects: resilience. Can't now wait. I. I've seen lots of postings and comments on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm sure. So I'm going to ask you a straight up question. To you, what does resilience mean? To me, resilience is, it's a relative measure of an organization's ability to deal with the unanticipated consequences of change. And if, if you want me to break that down a little bit, then I'm more than happy to do so. Yeah, actually, could you? Because you know, a lot of people, if you ask them what resilience is, the first thing they'll stay, say is, uh, you know, oh, uh, have a business continuity plan or the ability to bounce back. Yeah. But your yep. definition was neither one of those. It's, it's quite a bit different. I, what I think we need to do is I think we need to think differently about resilience. And, and in doing so, if we think about resilience in this way as, as being a measure of not being a state, right? Like an organization is resilient or it's not resilient or a person or a team is resilient versus not resilient. And, and also if we can get out of this idea that resilience is kind of this, kind of an objective measure. As long as you've done X, Y, Z, you're taking very specific steps, you will have achieved either improved resilience or um, gotten you to this state that you want to be. And instead think of it in terms of, like I said, it, it's a relative, measure. So resilience is not something, at least in today's world, that we can measure objectively, right? We can't, we can't put everybody against um, a, a measuring stick and say, well, you sit here on the scale and somebody else sits here. All we can, my belief is all we can really say is that an organization, an organization's level of resilience is better or worse in comparison to some other organization or some group of organizations. But there are kind of, see, we're off script already. I told you, for, for, <laughs> we said before we started, after one question, we'd be going off script. It's what we, we are, do. Already are. <laughs> well, then what do you have to say about some of these measurements that we see on 
so, you know, coming from vendors, you know, how do you measure your resilience and whether it be operational, organizational, or or even individual, you know, and they've got these scales and, and, and things that list, you know, you've got business continuity plans, you had an exercise and you changed your BCP. So now you're further ahead in your resilience. What do you have to say about those kind of things? I, I look at those really as, yeah. as compliance driven measures, right? So where in some cases we've taken a methodology or a business continuity life cycle or some, some kind of overall resilience framework, if you will, um, the measures that these vendors and others are using are really against that yardstick of where are you in the life cycle? Uh, where are you in the maturity model in relation to your execution against those activities that are driven by the methodology or the life cycle? I personally have not seen any evidence that the life cycles that we've developed for business continuity and that have now evolved to encompass resilience deliver anything in terms of better outcomes when disasters and disruptions occur. Um, if there is such evidence, I welcome anybody to please share it with me. Um, I, I, I think most of the methodologies and the frameworks and the life cycles that we see out there really drive program implementation, right? They're the activities that people want to follow so that their program at least is consistent with some kind of some kind of third party standard or, or some kind of agreed upon approach. But those measures don't really tell you anything about really whether the actions you're taking, whether it's performing a BIA, developing a plan, maybe running an, an exercise or a test, um, they don't really tell you anything about whether those activities and the work you're doing in, that, in those spaces are actually contributing to improved resilience or contributing to an improved level of that measure of resilience. That needs to be a completely separate, separate measure. If you do want to utilize that framework for your program, perfectly fine. Just be completely aware that all you're doing is measuring the activities you're performing, not the actual outcomes that you're supposed to achieve from performing those activities. Does that make sense? To me, it does. Okay. There, good, there good. Has, I, sometimes I ramble and I worry about whether whether it just makes sense to me and I'm the only person in the room that's, <laughs> that's crazy enough to understand it. There has been one that uh, uh, you know, people that or, or vendors or organizations you know, measure your resilience and yet I can't, can't wrap my head around, well, measure against what? Because to your point, it's too, uh, a lot of it's compliance or audit driven, which means I'm measuring against this list that has a start and an end. Yeah. Whether whether my program is in maintenance mode, ongoing mode, or just starting, yep. I still have a start and an end to a list to measure against. Yep. Yeah. But if if you're measuring your, um, your your, it's not suggested to to do that, then how can you measure something that you can't even see, feel, touch, or or even document? It seems a contradiction. It, I wouldn't say it's a contradiction. You can, you can, so there's lots of ways you could measure the outcomes of what you're doing. Um, one way is through exercises. One way is through tests. Um, another way that, that I, I suggest people do is expand the scope of what they're defining fits within the business continuity and the resilience realm. Instead of it being something catastrophic that threatens the existence of the organization, mm -hmm. something that these types of events happen very few and very infrequently, and in some, some cases, not at all. Um, if we expand that to include anything that could cause what I call pain to the organization, lost revenue, lost customers, performance, impacts, um, productivity impacts. If you have a program that's measuring what your performance, what your productivity is, um, what you're producing on a regular basis is on the best of days, when those disruptions come along, if you have a program that enables you to deal more effectively with those disruptions when they do occur, then you can start to measure, well, what kind of dip did we see in productivity? How many widgets did we miss that particular day in relation to what we normally 
produce. And if we can improve upon that, then we've put ourselves in a, in a better situation. So, so yeah, we're expanding the scope of what we do, um, performing more frequent exercises. I think, I think too often we do that one exercise activity once a year, mm -hmm. but you're not going to get a whole lot of data and details from that. You'll, you'll get it in relation to that one scenario you're exercising that one time. You might do another scenario the following year, which will give you a whole host of additional information. But if you're doing these things more frequently, and I'm a big fan of like micro simulations of, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute activities, exercise activities with smaller groups so that you can put them on people's calendars, right? If it's mm -hmm. not 30 people, including 10 executive level folks, maybe it's one executive and a small team of, of 10, you could probably get that done in half an hour. You could schedule it a week ahead of time do a very quick rapid simulation, throw some randomness and some chaos into the mix, and you've got <laughs> some data. If, if you do this, just say once a month, at the end of 12 months, at the end of a year, think how much more data you have. Um, and, and think again about, in my view, how much more objective that data is. I guarantee you that if you're just mm -hmm. doing this once a year, really the lessons you learn are gonna be very specific to that scenario and all of the effort that you put in to, to test the response to that specific scenario going into it. If however, as a business continuity or a resilience professional, you're not doing all of this upfront work around injects and scenario details and instead maybe just google the term disaster and whatever comes to the top of your your results list that's your scenario for the day maybe you've got scenarios in a in a hat and people pick them at random maybe you use dice or a spinner to come up with random levels of impact that way everybody's kind of playing with the same limited view of what's what's about mm -hmm. to happen um, and if we do it that way again at the end of that 12 months if you've conducted 12 exercises, you now have a whole host of data um, matched up against very different scenarios, right? Unplanned scenarios, very random activities. And that will kind of, that can better inform what you need to do to improve than the data you're gonna get out of a single exercise over that 12 month period. Yeah, uh, contradiction wasn't the right word I should have used there, but uh, um, you still addressed it perfectly. Okay. And, and that uh, little micro exercise, I've done a few of those okay. uh, since uh, I took your adaptive course. So, <laughs> so everybody watching, that's a little nugget that you're going to learn. And uh, Mark just explained it really, really well. Thank you. Thank you. It's, pre it's pretty fun. What was your what was your experience doing that, Alex? Um, I find them fun. Mm -hmm. I, I think and people find them, even though you are still trying to get information and get people to understand things and uh, increase their awareness and participation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think people find them more fun too, because they're short. Yep. They don't have, to, you know, if, if you're having something big, you know, like some organizations do with their big, whether it be a tabletop or a simulation or anything, the bigger they are, the more people plan. Yeah. And they'll start meeting ahead of time, you know, yeah. because they want to know the scenario. <clears throat> but if you have these short ones, I find people tend to just kind of throw things out there. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting one. What would we do? And then right off the bat, you know, ah, I've already identified a gap and nobody said a word. <laughs> and you know, exactly. you've already you've already got benefit from it. Yes, so I, yeah. I find them uh, really easy. And I yeah. plan on doing one with my uh, business continuity advisor groups. And they, they don't know that. <laughs> I'll keep I'll keep it between you and I. Yeah. <laughs> you you brought up a good point though, right? Which which is so often when we when we do these things once a year, we kind of want them to go a certain way. And I I do believe there's a there's a big part of artificiality that's built into those because you are kind of developing a scenario. And a lot of people are probably pre-planning and pre-staging stuff so that mm -hmm. things go well, right? They don't yeah. fail. Whereas if we're doing this not necessarily as a test, but hey, it's an opportunity for us to practice. It's an opportunity for us to work together as a team and figure out yep. what would we do if some unforeseen, un unanticipated situation were to befall us. Then, it, yeah, it, again, it becomes more fun. And again, I think I think it sets a better expectation that we're we're not going to grade you based on what you do or how you come out of this particular scenario, but instead we're using it as a learning opportunity and a practice opportunity. Yeah, and that makes all the difference. Yeah, people are no longer fearful of, oh my God, I'm going to fail. 
my my exactly. boss is going to look down on me or the vp is going to be <laughs> mad with us you know that kind of thing so, yeah yeah uh, makes a big difference exactly so we talked about um uh, what your your thoughts on resilience is what are some of the misconceptions people have about resilience ah uh, where do i start um <laughs> <laughs> that that much huh <laughs> yeah 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 there's 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 again i i think i already mentioned one which is we think of resilience as a state right mm -hmm. that you're either resilient or you're not resilient um and i i think i think we need to overcome that and understand that really any organization has some level of resilience it might be very minimal if you're stacking up against other organizations maybe it's not particularly good but it in relation to maybe other organizations, it, it might be relatively robust. And if we can think of it that way, I think we put ourselves in a better place. Um, I think another misconception is um, really let's let's talk about people because this is this is another maybe pet peeve of mine or something that I see a lot. There's this there's this belief that if we can improve the resilience of the individuals within an organization that's going to result in a more resilient organization. And I, I don't think that's true. I think what you will get is an organization made up of more resilient people. But if, if those people, if, if they don't have any connection, if, if they aren't unified around the organization's mission, um, if they don't have strong relationships, and if something does go wrong, those relationships are very fragile, then if they're individually resilient, that means that they're, they're probably going to abandon the organization and focus on their own personal resilience and not the, or, not the resilience of the organization. If, however, you have strong connections and relationships within your organization, if people do buy into the vision and the mission of that organization, that creates a more resilient organization such that if something does happen that's that's unforeseen and causes great disruption, people are quickly going to come together as a group and say, how can we get this business back up and running? Because we do believe in the services and the products that we deliver. We do want to deliver for the customers that we support. That's how resilience is achieved and not through. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on individual and personal resilience. I think there's value in that, but I don't, I don't think we should, we should push it in terms of contributing to the organization's resilience. I think there's two completely different, two com different efforts with two different outcomes. So what about culture then? Does that play an impact more on the individual resilience or the overall organizational or resilience? How does that play a part? That's, so now, now, we're now we're diving into some deep territory, right? <laughs> if, we're, if we're talking the organization's culture, then absolutely it's gonna, it, that's a part of the organization's resilience. And if it isn't a culture that fosters strong relationships, um, if it doesn't foster um, that support of the organization's mission and its objectives and achieving for the customers that it serves, then yeah, that's, that's going to result in a relatively weak level of resilience. But I said, this is, this is, we can go very deep here because there's other, other cultural factors that contribute to that organization's resilience. What's the community that it, that it operates in and what's the culture of that community. And when I say community, it could be the local community that that business operates in. Maybe it's a metro area, maybe it's a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, there's also there's also the community of the industry, right? That it that it operates in is is it transportation? Is it hospitality? Is it energy? Because they all have their own kind of cultures within those industries that that contr themselves contribute or can contribute to the organization's overall resilience and and we when we when we talk about culture we just have to be cognizant of the fact that we can't look at organizational culture in a vacuum or as a silo it's a part of all of these other cultures that that can affect it affect it positively or negatively not that we can necessarily affect those cultures sure if you're a big player in an industry you might be able to drive a culture within the broader industry yes if you're a big player in that local community, maybe you can have some positive impacts on the culture. But if you are just a relatively small player, your influence is probably going to be limited 
But if you have that awareness, you can perhaps compensate for it within your own organizational culture. That's interesting. I'm glad you pointed that out because a lot of times when you hear about resilience and an organization's culture, it's all internal. But you just brought up some good examples where to create that, if I'm understanding correctly, to create a really good culture, you also have to look externally. Yes. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. You have you have to realize that you are a player in all of these communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, to if without it, and I think I I this gets to you the question that you asked, which is what's a misconception? And I think I don't know if I call this a misconception, but I think this is this is a problem intrinsic in our approach to business continuity and resilience. Is we so often think of disruptions in terms of how it impacts us and our organization. And we fail to consider that, well, any event that significantly disrupts organization could also affect the community that we operate in, could also mm -hmm. be affecting the industry that we operate in, could be affecting our customers. And the result of which is it changes their demand for our products and services, what they need from us and the services that we produce. And that's why I think so often, I, I won't say programs, fail, but they struggle because they predict, perfect example is, is COVID-19. 2019, what were we all planning for in terms of a pandemic? How are we going to deal with a short staff situation? Well, that, that's, that's very narrow-minded because we're only thinking in terms of, well, if we can't get employees into our work, how are we going to continue to operate and deliver services for our customers and products? But if we're talking about a pandemic, and, and now we have two years of hindsight to, to rely on to know this is the case, if we're dealing with a global, global pandemic, well, it's not your employees, it's your customers or your clients' employees. It's, it's mm -hmm. the community that you operate. It's all of your competitors and their employees. It drastically changes the dynamic and the environment that you're operating in. We've seen this time and time again over the past two years that organizations weren't dealing with just losing workspace because people couldn't come into the office. They weren't just losing um, the ability to operate in a, in say a retail environment or a restaurant or a hospitality environment. They were dealing with the effects of people weren't traveling, right? People weren't coming in and sitting in restaurants. They wanted to get their food delivered curbside. People weren't going into a bookstore. They were going online. So a lot of these organizations had to pivot and find new ways to satisfy their customers' needs and demands in this new world. And it had absolutely nothing to do with dealing with how they're going to do with it, deal with a short staff situation. Well, I went down a rabbit hole there. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I'd, hopefully everybody's still awake. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they are. Do you have anything else you'd like to say on resilience? Because I know I've got another question for you. We're going to record that separate because uh, that one I'm going to let you loose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I can't, any, I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any final uh, thoughts you'd like to uh, convey regarding resilience? <sighs> let me, let me stop and think for a second. Um, personal resilience. No, I mean the only the only thing that I will I will add, and this is hopefully this is this becomes obvious as a theme in what I've covered so far, is a a, a big part when we talk about resilience is relationships. Mm -hmm. So again, getting back to what I said, you know, you can be personally resilient, um, but really how you contribute to an organization's resilience is the relationships you have within the organization. Um, and it, there's, there's a, somebody in the employee health and safety space that I follow, his name is Dr. Todd Conklin. He mentions making the development and maintenance of professional relationships a program strategy. So I think so often we think of relationships as something that's, an, that's simply a byproduct of the work that we do, right? I need to go get support for the, the, the plans that I need to develop or the exercise activity. So I'm going to go meet with this person and we'll form a relationship. I think we need to turn that around and we need to first and foremost establish positive relationships. And what that's going to help us with, right, is when we do have needs for support or action or approval or something, we've already got a relationship with, some, with somebody. If there is a disruption or an outage, we already have a relationship with the people that we might need to reach out to, to help us come together and, and, and resolve the situation and figure out how we're going to, how we're going to work and operate. Um, and, and the magic that really happens, and, and I, I've, 
I've told people this many times is that I don't pride myself on being the person with all of the answers, but I do pride myself in my organization of knowing who has the answers. Um, and that's because I have a, a broad base of relationships with my organization. And anytime somebody comes to me, I can point them to this person. And now when I do that, right, now we're creating that web of relationships. I have now put them in touch with somebody else that's created a new relationship in the organization. And there's not, in my view, there are few things, if anything, as powerful or more powerful than that capability, building all of those relationships and those networks within the organization. And when you introduce people, you may only know, you know one, but they actually end up, you become like a triangle, you know, the three of us now. Baby, exactly, exactly. People, you know, now they're part of one another's networks, right? So it's kind yeah. of exponential. Yes, exactly, yeah. That's exactly where I was going. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Didn't mean to steal your thunder, Alex. Oh no, no, no that's fine. <laughs> Don't worry. I knew where you're going, and I just, I just, I just threw us all there quicker. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of this episode. We're talking with Mark Armour today about resilience. You're going to want to listen to the next part of uh, our talk because we're going to ask him how adaptive business continuity and resilience go together. So you're not going to want to miss that because I'm going to let him loose. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> oh, I know it will. <laughs> so on that note, Mark, thanks very much for, for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Alex. And everybody watching, stay prepared, everybody. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.